Hello, this is Clive Friddle, and this is The Current, and we are uh, recording this in December, so it is unashamedly holiday season here, and I'm very happy that joining me today is Jeremy Arnold, um, and he's going to talk about his book, which is Christmas in the Movies. Um, welcome, Jeremy, and uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Clive, for having me. Great so, pleasure to be here. So Christmas in the movies um, is obviously uh, a topic that everybody will have a point of view about. Everybody has their favorite film. I'm going to tell you mine shortly. Um, and they're going to argue why is it not included in your selection. So first of all, help us out. How do you understand what to include in this book? What's the frame? Well, I think to answer that, I should back up a little bit and explain that uh, this is a book that was done as part of the partnership between Running Press and Turner Classic Movies. Um, I have a long association with Turner Classic Movies. I've contributed to their website and taken part in all sorts of uh, activities that that they do, speaking at festivals and so forth. My editor at Running Press, uh, Cindy Sapala, she told me that um, she and uh, TCM had come up with the idea of doing a book about Christmas films. And she asked me if I'd be interested in taking it on. And I wasn't so sure at first. I, I, I like holiday movies just fine, but I'd never really given them much thought in terms of exploring them in a somewhat intellectual way. But as I thought about it and started looking at the movies again, I, um, I grew more interested and I, I, I took the offer because what interested me was exploring what it really means to be a Christmas movie. Everyone defines the term in their own way because it isn't really a genre like a Western or a musical. For some people, if Christmas is merely mentioned or glimpsed in the film, that makes it a Christmas movie. And for others, it maybe has to be set entirely on the day or on the, the night before, whatever it might be. And um, I came up with my definition, uh, which we'll get into more later, but briefly, my definition is it, it's any film in which some aspect of Christmas, of the Christmas season, plays a meaningful role in the story, a meaningful role in terms of the way the audience experiences the story. And Christmas means many different things to many people, uh, you know, joy and love and family togetherness and or maybe loneliness and despair and cynicism, commercialism. All these things are great fodder for Christmas movies in many genres. In terms of how um, I chose the movies, the um, this is not an encyclopedia, the subtitle uh, of the book is 30 classics to celebrate the season. Uh, TCM and Running Press and I agreed that 30 would be a manageable number. Um, and since it is Turner Classic Movies, the book does focus mostly on studio era classic films from before 1960. That's the TCM really audience. Uh, but it does go up into the early 2000s because there are some modern classics that really have to be in there, which we can get into. So, you know, when you start with that approach, a lot of the titles sort of fall into place uh, pretty quickly. And then you really only have maybe five or six slots, if you will, to fill with with other films, with maybe more modern films or more offbeat films. And we can get into that. But really, the thrust of the book is classic Hollywood, since it's a TCM book. And that's how we started. And you said that you didn't necessarily uh, have this concept sort of top of mind uh, as a film historian. How did you find looking at some of, uh, especially some of those classic films again, did you find there were, did you find them sappy or did you find there were elements to them that you thought, well, actually this is, there's quality here that I, I hadn't thought to look for before? Very much the latter. Um, because sure, I, I grew up loving a Miracle on 34th Street and It's a Wonderful Life. And to some degree, Christmas in Connecticut and uh, The Bishop's Wife and, and others. But when I started looking at them through the prism of how is the Christmas season being used by the artists involved as an element in the storytelling, it really grew interesting to me uh, because I feel that when, when we see a movie that is set around some aspect of the holiday season and we're watching during the holiday season, we're already bringing as an audience something else to the experience. We're bringing, um, I guess, maybe an extra willingness to accept the, the warmth and the joy that, that might be on display in a particular story because we, we crave that at this time of year. And so if there's any inkling of that in a movie, we, it sort of gets amplified. And that, how that affects 
the storytelling is actually rather interesting, I think. And it works for the more negative emotions too. I mean, Jimmy Stewart standing on the bridge contemplating suicide in its wonderful life, you know, that's sort of an extreme uh, end of the element of despair and loneliness and uh, um, feeling alone during the Christmas season, something all of us can relate to at some point in our lives. Christmas does that. It makes the higher highs higher and the lows lower. And suicide is just in dramatic terms to a storyteller. It's the logical end of that part of the spectrum of emotion, which is why suicide actually turns up a lot in Christmas movies. I was amazed that there are four movies out of 30 in my book that have either a suicide or an attempted suicide, um, which is rather remarkable, even in movies that are otherwise comedies. Yeah, it's it's interesting. You picked out that surprisingly dark element, which is perhaps there as a way of um, contrast for the lighter parts that had come. Do you find uh, that any of the Christmas movies managed to smuggle in anything else unexpected? Is there Are there little pieces of political radicalism that slip into any of these movies? I don't know if I... Political radicalism sounds a bit much for, <laughs> for any of these films, but sure, there are some. Um, the Miracle on 34th Street, which is brilliant in the way that it plays with the line between realism and fantasy throughout... Another aspect of it is the way it approaches commercialism. Chris Kringle in that film, he's very he's all about fighting the commercial aspects of Christmas time. And there are some political elements during the trial scene. The judge is and the the prosecuting attorney, they're under political pressure to handle the trial a certain way. I mean, it's done in a comedic way, but it's still there. Um but I think even more interesting is the fact that I realized many Christmas movies came out in the 1940s uh, during World War II and immediately after. And the war really, uh, it's no accident. It really had an effect on these films because in terms of American society, World War II was a time where families were being ripped apart. And after World War II, you had millions of broken families struggling to go on and remaining broken or trying to piece themselves back together and rebuild themselves with servicemen and women coming home. Maybe some of them were physically or psychologically damaged and how that affected the rebuilding of the family unit. That does come into play in a lot of these 40s films because Christmas is so much about family togetherness and families building or rebuilding themselves, family dysfunction too. But in the 40s, it, Christmas seems to really be used as representing the family unit. And so when you set a family story at Christmas time, it, 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 Christmas is sort of like a catalyst that helps the characters find each other again, maybe learn to accept each other again, whatever the story might, might call for. That's really interesting. And of course, the families in the 40s who might have seen these films when they first came out, and of course, they wouldn't have come out en masse as a kind of holiday oeuvre. Uh, they'd have come out year by year. But they would have seen them in the movie theater, too. Uh, so do you have any sense of how they were watched? Would, would the family have gone at, at any particular point in the holidays? They wouldn't have gone on Christmas Day, presumably, because that in the 40s was still likely to be uh, a home-based celebration, religious for those people who believed in it, presumably not for those who didn't. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm actually not sure if like how much business movies did on Christmas Day back then, as opposed to now, where it is a pretty common activity, although not this year, unfortunately, uh, going out to the theater. But um, you do hit on a couple of interesting things, which is one, there were many more movies made in those days that were geared for all audiences. There wasn't as much of the segmentation as there is now, where it's to certain quadrants or teenage boys mostly, or whatever it might be. There were many more films that were designed for everybody, including pretty much all of these Christmas movies. And the other thing is that a lot of these films actually did not open at Christmas time. Now, for some people that might mean, well, then they're not a Christmas movie because they weren't opened. They didn't, they weren't designed to be seen at Christmas. Miracle on 34th Street opened in June, I believe. Um, and it had no hint of Christmas in its advertising. Uh, the studio Fox, they, they weren't sure it was going to do very well. So they opened it in the summer because that was the height of the movie going season. And they thought they'd uh, capitalize more that way. It turned into one of the biggest sleeper hits in Hollywood history. And it played for many months. Um, 
you know, but not not at Christmas time, which seems kind of bizarre. Christmas in Connecticut, I think, also opened in August or September. Um, Shop Around the Corner opened in January. There are actually a lot of movies that opened not during November or December. So, um, yeah, I um, the idea of a Christmas movie, of making a movie as a quote-unquote Christmas movie, didn't really exist back then. It's more now, you know, in the 80s and 90s and ever since, um, that that is really in the minds of the filmmakers as a conscious aspect of, of the project. So that's really interesting. So, so our Christmas movies now that we think of um, are, it seems to me, unashamedly nostalgic. Um, not only the more recent ones that you've included um, in your book, which, which sort of drip with nostalgia of a different kind, but also the way that we look at the old movies. We're not looking at Christmas as a plot line so much as we're, we're, we're imbuing it with a certain holiday emotion and saying this sums up our feelings for this time of year. So it's different than how those films perhaps originally would have, would have been seen. You know, like I said, the Christmas can mean different things. Nostalgia is one of those things for sure. And you take a movie like uh, Meet Me in St. Louis, which is, was made in the 40s. It's set at the turn of the century, decades earlier. And only the last quarter of the movie is set um, at Christmas time. Um, it's one of the few movies that is not set very much at Christmas, but still is a Christmas film, it, partly because of the song, Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas, sung by Judy Garland, which would be enough to make any movie a Christmas movie. But the experience that we have watching that film and that people did back then was nostalgia. And looking back on a simpler time where the family as a unit, the, the love in that family, the togetherness of the family, that is what audiences, when the film came out in the mid forties would have been longing for and craving because their audience, their families were split up with uh, people fighting the war across the world. Uh, White Christmas in uh, the fifties is also deeply nostalgic. And that's a fascinating case because you have the song White Christmas, which had been introduced in Holiday Affair, sung by Bing Crosby to Marjorie Reynolds, and it was used purely romantically as a romantic ballad, and it's, it, it was really tied to love in that film. By the time of White Christmas, the song was completely aligned with nostalgia, and Bing Crosby sings it at the beginning of the film to soldiers um, on the battlefield, and you can see them sort of uh, lost in their own memories and thoughts as they hear him sing. And then at the end of the movie, he performs it again to an audience in the film of veterans. So you have layers of nostalgia because now they're maybe remembering the time when they were at war, hearing the song and re remembering their own families. So there are certain movies where nostalgia plays a key role, but then there are other movies of the time, like uh, Holiday Affair comes to mind, Robert Mitchum, Janet Lee. 1949. That's a very modern of the moment film set in present day New York City, um, where the idea of Christmas isn't nostalgia, but it it ties. She's a war widow and she's trying to choose between Robert Mitchum and Wendell Corey uh, as a new husband. <laughs> Guess who wins? Um, but yeah, <laughs> the idea is that it's, you know, there's a film where it's not nostalgia. It's very much present day um, of the moment. So it's very interesting to compare. So I would have thought that perhaps one thing that links to the nostalgia question maybe is that there seems to be a fairly strong element of, if not fantasy, then um, an absolute best case scenario playing out in many of these films. Uh, is that fair? Yeah, I think so. I mean, Christmas certainly lends itself to fantasy. You know how I said before, when we see a movie at Christmas time, we want the warmth and joy of the holiday. We want sort of the, the, the goodness, the holiday to win out in the end somehow in the story and for there to be a happy ending. Pretty much every Christmas movie pretty much has to have a happy ending, I think. Um, but it also makes us accept fantasy much more readily because Christmas is a fantastical time. The Bishop's Wife, you have angels as part of the story. Now, it's kind of hard to make a movie with an angel talking to a real person and have it work and not be just laughable or simplistic or some kind of silly. Um, and it's hard to get the tone just right. Um, and there are other films that have ghosts and uh, supernatural elements. And I think the Christmas setting helps those things to work more. Yeah, I'm a big fan of, uh, of Scrooge, um, partly because of Alistair Sim. Uh, and of course, um, that story has has um, perhaps the most famous Christmas ghosts as being kind of integral 
characters the plot and beyond um and also kind of an interesting interesting sub plot of politics there you know rich man refuses to give away any of his wealth to the greater good and is persuaded to do so Absolutely. in a rather sort of dickensian liberal uh way um so I want to go back to the fantasy and just ask you about one thing. And one thing I did notice was um, that in in the selection, of course, perhaps unsurprisingly in the in the classic movies, but maybe also with the uh, getting to more, more towards the more recent ones. Um, so we do kind of want a bit of a fantasy when we're watching movies over the holidays. We want whatever our version of the good guys are to emerge triumphant in whatever the scenario is. And I was thinking back to when I was growing up in the UK, the only thing I could think of as a consistent staple of, of Christmas time was that there would be a Bond movie. Um, and um, uh, thank you for the Bond reference in your introduction, by the way. Um, but the, the Bond movie was there, I think, because, you know, the one thing a Bond movie does for British people is make you think that, you know, one secret agent um, will solve everything ultimately to the greater good. Um, and I was struggling to think of any other movie that was was an absolutely surefire um, regular in the UK at Christmas time. And I'm wondering now if in, a, in our world in the, you know, 2020 going into 2021, um, our audiences needs are so much more diverse than they used to be that it's hard for everybody to agree about one Christmas movie or even, you know, to have one Christmas kind of fantasy that we can agree on. Um, do you think that's, is that, is that getting harder? Is it, is it difficult to get everybody to agree to, you know, cross generations, across cultures on one feel good film or what, what even a feel good thing <laughs> is? Uh, oh, absolutely. We're in a polarized time, <laughs> I think, worldwide. And um, But I don't know that it's really so important for everyone to agree on one. I mean, I, I like that there's a whole variety of movies that incorporate Christmas. And there are feel-good ones. There are, you know, dramas. There are dra straight dramas that I include in this book that some people might not really consider as a Christmas movie because they're not designed to be necessarily... Um, uplifting and to make you feel really good, um, even though they also have their their happy endings and they have uh, some joy to them. I, For example, there's a British film in here called The Holly and the Ivy, made in 1952, which I'm very fond of. And in fact, I did the commentary track for the Blu-ray release last year, so people can learn more about it there. Um, but this is sort of a, it made in 52, set in 48, based on a play by Winyard Brown, with a wonderful cast of British theater stars at the time, Ralph Richardson, Celia Johnson, Margaret Layton, Denham Elliott, very early in his career. And this is a, a family dysfunction Christmas movie where the family is gathering over the holidays at their old family house in Norfolk. The father is also a parson at the local church. And he's the movie is all about the disconnection between the father and the grown-up children. And it's one of the few movies I, I know where the dynamic between adult children and their parents is really explored and the dad, the dynamics between the adult siblings themselves. It's very, um, it's very relatable. I find, even though to American audiences today, it's, you know, totally different world so long ago, so far away, but the, the, the core issues are still very much, um, relatable, I think today. And I don't know, to get back to your question though, um, I also think that when I, I think that when when our society goes through some big trauma, it tends to unleash escapist films and Christmas movies. The '40s, as I mentioned, re, uh, um, spawned many many Christmas films, and and also film noir. Right, that was in part a reaction to World War II and the alienation that that soldiers felt coming back and trying to re-enter American society and having a hard time of it. Well, after 9/11 you also got a spate of a spurt rather of Christmas movies, uh, Elf and Love Actually uh, and and others, not to mention the whole Hallmark <laughs> Christmas movie genre on television, although I think that's another genre altogether. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if in the next five years after this pandemic, um, in addition to getting some modern version of film noir to that sort of channels the 
the weird dislocation and alienation that we have felt because of this last year, that we also maybe get a bunch of Christmas movies because we want to feel good. And that's a way to bring people together and connect to the idea of family that we've all been connecting to in the last year, maybe more than ever, and getting a greater appreciation for that. So there's sort of a political social aspect to to this on a, a large sort of uh, on a more uh, macro level. Uh, but I guess time will tell. Listen, thank you so much for um, making Christmas very three dimensional in your selection of the movies, a, a complicated, complicated uh, time of year, as you point out. Um, and excellent to have a movie that allows us to dream of killing our family. Um, I think we're all probably going to need that, one of those this year, <laughs> having spent so long together. Um, so, Jeremy, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your uh, your selection, um, for being on The Current. And, of course, we wish you uh, very happy holidays and uh, peaceful and prosperous 2021. Thank you, Clive. My same wishes to you and to anyone who has been watching or listening. Thank you. Hachette.